Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us on a, a slightly frosty afternoon. We're slightly worried, this being a, a real in-person event, that uh, the weather might put off a few people, but really glad to see people back in the, uh, the real. Um, welcome to the University of Surrey. For those of you that aren't, uh, aren't part of the University of Surrey, welcome to our visitors. Uh, we've got an interesting set of speakers, an interesting topic, and I hope you'll engage with it fully. Um, this is the, I'm losing count now, I think seventh or eighth joint, uh, seventh joint uh, event between the University of Surrey's, the Centre for Cybersecurity at the University of Surrey, and the SASIG, uh, the UK's largest cyber network. Um, and if you're not a member of one, you're certainly a member of the other. Uh, so we welcome both. Um, and this has been a really interesting collaboration that we set up a couple of years ago. The purpose here is to really get people involved in the field of cybersecurity to think into the future. Uh, a lot of professionals who spend their time in cybersecurity find themselves focusing on the, what am I dealing with right now in the next few hours, the next few days, and uh, don't allow themselves generally to think about what might I be thinking about in the next few years, a really difficult topic. And uh, this topic came about because we were talking about as the, the increased use of biometrics and the equally um, rapacious pace of faking biometrics. Uh, and I come from the AI side. So um, people who've been playing with ChatGPT and uh, other platforms are available, uh, will realize the, the huge advances that have been made in uh, faking human beings. I'm looking forward to the new ITV show, which is like spitting images, but oh, a spitting image with, uh, fake celebrities, uh, which is going to sort of push the boundaries a bit. That's that's in a few days' time. So uh, start start thinking about that. So we're talking about the future of identity. We've got a, a distinguished panel of speakers today. Um, we've got, um, I'm going to refer to my notes, apologies for that. We've got Professor uh, Carsten Maple, who is online, who's going to be doing it with Zoom, even though this event isn't real, couldn't be here in person, uh, followed by Steve Schneider, Professor Steve Schneider, who's head of the uh, sorry, Center for Cybersecurity. Rob Solly, who's CEO and founder of Cosymmetry uh, Limited, amongst other companies. Uh, other companies are available, as I understand it. Uh, and Paul Simmons, the CEO of Global Identity Foundation, again, with a, a long history, uh, in fact, having given quite a few talks at the University of Surrey. Um, but before we kick off on that, um, I was just going to ask uh, Steve and Danny to talk a bit, give us a very short intro as to who the SASIG are and who uh, SECS are. So, um, Steve, you're up first. Tell us a bit about the cybersecurity at Sorry. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so, just um, a, a couple of words about the Sorry Centre for Cybersecurity. So, you'll see me twice today once as the director of the Sorry Centre for Cybersecurity. So, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you as one of the, the hosts um, of, of this event. Um, and uh, but uh, as it happens, I'm also a speaker later on, so you'll see me in a, in another role. So just to give a, a brief introduction to those of you that aren't aren't aware of it of of what we do, and we also have the latest brochure out that I think you've been able to pick up on the on the way in. So by all means, take a copy of the brochure uh, if you want to see in more detail what in what we do. We're an academic centre of excellence, which means we have recognition from the National um, Cybersecurity Centre. Uh, part, of, part of GCHQ, both for cybersecurity research and for cybersecurity education, where we have a, a gold, uh, the, the, top, the top award in terms of what we do. So that's uh, in the, the kind of national landscape. We're one of um, not many universities that have both of those accolades. We have about 50 researchers um, at all levels across, across the center. And we work in the foundations and applications of cybersecurity, privacy, and related areas. So we're interested, you know, in the, the foundations of the subject and the fundamentals and that we do research there and about how it's applied in the real world. And we're very keen on that symbiotic relationship between uh, the theory and the, the application. Um, and, you know, we run an MSc, we have doctoral training and, and all of those kind of things that you'd expect um, to be to be happening at a, at a university. Um, and uh, we we're constantly on the lookout for new opportunities for, for collaboration and for applying 
our, our research, looking for case studies, looking for where we can actually test it out in, in the wild, in, in the real world. So anyone that's, that's interested in, uh, in working with us, by all means, reach out. I see a, no, a number of colleagues here from the, from the centre are, are dotted around and some, um, may be available afterwards when we're, um, we're uh, at the refreshment stage for, for any more detailed interactions. Um, and in particular, the application domains that we're um, that, that we operate in, you know, we have projects, particularly in these areas, in transport, um, in you know, various government uh, voting kind of applications. Uh, communications is a is a big one, um, and finance. So these are uh, the kind of application domains that we are uh, most active in. But we're we're interested in uh, the kind of security. The security is all pervasive and needed everywhere, and we're interested in um, in applying in all of all of these areas. So that's all I'll say about the the Centre for Cybersecurity for now. But um, we'll be happy to talk uh, talk more later. So I'll hand over now to the co co sponsor. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us today, and um, just to introduce. Um, ourselves, uh, SASIG, I'm a representative today for SASIG. We are the Security Awareness Special Interest Group um, and uh, delighted um, to, be, uh, to be working alongside the, uh, the Surrey Centre for Cyber Security. SASIG uh, has been operating for the coming up to nearly 20 years now um, with the, 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 the single mission to improve trust uh, in the online environment. We have um, now, after COVID and uh, being online for three years, nearly 8,000 uh, members representing uh, 2,500 uh, organisations, some of whom I can uh, see dotted in the audience today. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. And it's a, it's a real opportunity really for, uh, for industry and those wanting to come into the industry um, to, gun, to come together um, and to, uh, to discuss, uh, as Andrew said, matters not just in the next uh, few months and uh, years, but looking really further afield as well. Um, Today is the seventh uh, iteration. Um, we've been doing this for the last couple of years now. Um, and uh, as I say, it it's gives us an opportunity to uh, look more academically than SASIC otherwise look would at uh, some of the, the various aspects of cybersecurity. We have two more events coming up later this year in, in collaboration with uh, the centre. So please do look out for those and uh, looking to, to hold many more. Certainly uh, we are uh, uh, very inspired by uh, what we can uh, offer you. We're also grateful for um, SASIG supporters um, who uh, over the years, um, simply without their, their, their financial assistance and their thought leadership that they bring to our events, we wouldn't be able to exist. So uh, a big uh, thanks to those. Um, and just to talk a little bit about some of our other activities taking place. So SASIG, now we're back in full swing after, uh, after uh, uh, the last three years. Um, we're now doing, as well as 35 in-person events, 130 webinars. So there's a lot of content for you to choose from. Um, next Friday, um, rather this Friday rather, Backup and Recovery Systems were built for dinosaurs. So we're learning how real-time data protection and time-sensitive recovery um, can keep you operational. Next week, Security Meets Safety, um, look, discovering the risks around connected medical devices and the catastrophic effect that uh, attack could have on human health. Um, Wednesday, how to uh, change security behavior, a step-by-step -step pictures um, guide and everything where we break down the components, steps and processes need to change security behaviors in the workplace. And next Friday, uh, a look at the uh, DLA Piper annual GDPR fines and breach discussion report. So they'll be discussing the uh, key findings and themes to learn about breach trends and regular, regulatory uh, enforcement. So that's just a, 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 a glance really at some of the events that we do uh, on a weekly and monthly basis. In our in-person events coming up, so next Tuesday, um, I'll be there as well at Bletchley uh, and uh, we do an escape room challenge there, uh, which is always good fun, but also a great opportunity to, to network with uh, other peers within the industry as well. Um, and then on Tuesday 31st, um, combating cyber fraud through collaboration um, in Chelmsford. So discovering really in terms of how business and law enforcement um, can work together to improve uh, cyber uh, resilience and reduce cyber fraud. And then next month, 
uh, we go over to uh, Guernsey and up to Edinburgh as well. So one thing that we are proud of at SASIG is breaking out from London and the Southeast and as often as possible, um, visiting uh, the regions and bringing local topics to the communities as well. So a good couple of examples of those. And then next, uh, rather later this year in May, uh, we are holding our flagship conference. We call it Big SASIG. Um, and it's a, a day full of conference presentations, keynotes, um, networking opportunities, and an opportunity to learn more about what the suppliers of the industry um, can offer as well. So a few households, um, well, first of all, do follow us on, SAS, uh, on SASIG uh, LinkedIn and SASIG Twitter as well. Um, so you can find out all about our events as uh, they're uh, being fixed. Other rules, um, the Chatham House rules. So by all means, do tell people about what you've learned uh, and what you've discussed today. But if we could not attribute it to the speakers, that just allows us to have a more open uh, and honest conversation. Afterwards at six, there will be a networking opportunity and we would ask you to, uh, to stay. And based on my experience um, from when I was here last time, I know people are super enthused by what we spoke about. So there'll be lots of conversation. Do stay around, some nice food and great company good conversations uh, and uh, new people to meet as well. During today, between four and six, please do feel free to ask any questions um, at the end, I believe, though, we could keep those to the end. So if you've got any way to write them down or jot them on your mobile in the meantime, um, if you could um, start your uh, session with just ask, uh, stating who you are and where you're coming from, that would be helpful. Um, as I've just done now, if you could place your mobiles on silent, if you haven't already done so. Um, a recording will be available um, towards the end of the week, so Friday or Monday, both on the Centre's website and on SASIGS as well. So uh, if you found today of interest, do please refer your peers and your colleagues uh, on to the, the recording there and hopefully inspire them to come back for our future editions. Um, we do welcome your feedback, so um, if you have any um, ways in which we can improve, do tell us. Um, and also, likewise, if you found uh, today fantastic, do tell your friends, as I've said. And, and also, if you feel that you've got something of interest to contribute to as well, do let us know as well, because we're always looking out for new speakers uh, and new topics to discuss as well. And I'll just say it one last time. Please do tell your friends about SASIG and the great work that uh, the centre here are doing as well. Other than that, enjoy the afternoon. Do network, do ask questions, do engage. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Danny. I, I particularly like the idea of going to Milton Keynes being locked in a room. So you have to make your five new friends until you get out. Um, very, very ingenious. Um, so uh, our first speaker, uh, Professor Carsten Maple, from, uh, who's Professor of Cybersecurity Engineering at the University of Warwick, um, is going to uh, talk about trustworthy, trustworthy digital identity. And I hope we've got the digital uh, tech working. Uh, Carsten, over to you. Oh, sorry, I, I, I should explain the format, although Danny's done most of it. Uh, we're each of the speakers will be 20 minutes. Hold your questions till the end, because I'll invite speakers back uh, as a panel, and then uh, we can ask the questions across all of them rather than individually. So we'll get through the talks. Remember your questions, uh, because you, you, will, uh, you will get absorbed into the other presentations, but remember them as you go along, uh, and then we'll uh, wrap up at the end. Uh, so Carsten, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I trust you can hear me. Um, thanks very much to um, the Surrey Centre for Cybersecurity um, and SASIC. I, I should say that um, I'm a member of SASIC. It's a great organisation. I've known it for many years and I've had the pleasure of working with uh, the University of Surrey on various projects over the years. Um, actually, um, just like uh, the University of Surrey, um, there is an academic centre of excellence for both research and teaching um, and education, sorry, at the University of, of Warwick. So, so we are uh, NCSC certified in both of those uh, areas. Um, and I lead the, the academic centre of excellence in cybersecurity research, much as Steve leads down, down at Surrey. But today um, I'm going to talk about some work I do with the Alan Turing Institute, where, where I'm a, a fellow. And I'm going to talk about um, a project specifically called Trustworthy Digital Identity. So this is a, a $5 million project. We're about three years into it. Um, it's funded by the Bill and Mil Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and I'm pleased to lead the program with John Crowcroft, who's researcher at large at the Turing and Marconi Chair at Cambridge. 
And we've got um, a number of researchers. So sometimes when I talk about some of the developments we've done, um, some of these researchers are, are behind that. Um, so Santosh, Jide, Tarek, uh, and Matthew. I should also say that at, at the Turing, one of the things that, and it's useful to say this about the project, is digital identity, as I'll talk in a moment, is becoming fundamental and really important to, to, to add significant value across um, the world and many countries are, are um, developing um, national digital identity schemes. You'll know that we're not doing that in the UK, but there are there are countries that are doing that. Um, and as part of our program here and that, that funded project, what we um, agreed to do was to convene uh, the community. And convening that community means bringing together um, people from government, people from academia, I know Steve's a member of the interest group, uh, and people from industry. Um, so for those of you with an interest in uh, digital identity, especially trustworthy digital identity, I encourage you to, to join that interest group. We have some great speakers, um, and there's some great lessons to learn, for example, around the trust framework that's been developed in New Zealand. Um, that trust framework is is different to the one in, in the UK, but um, there are lessons that were learned about how, how that was developed uh, around the assurance levels uh, of identity. So as you may know, in the UK, we've had a um, trust framework uh, developed, uh, DCMS leading on that, and they continue to evolve that framework. Um, and both the, the representatives from New Zealand and indeed from uh, the UK have spoken at interest group uh, meetings. And that's because we, we think it's really important to have this impact from the research we do. So much like Steve said uh, in, in his introduction, we, we think it, it's really important that academic research is informed by so that the challenges come from real world problems that, that, that we can really make a difference with. But also as an academic, we want to make sure that our, our um, research has got a route to um, making a difference. And that means engaging with practitioners, engaging with government, because we don't have um, the wherewithal, the, the, the resources, or indeed necessarily the um, inclination to, to take it right to the end, but we want somebody to take it and make that difference. Um, so digital identity is 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 really transforming uh, the world. And what we see is, I mean, I'm sure some of you are aware about the Adhar program in India, a, a program that rapidly um, enrolled 1.3 billion people into a national identity uh, system. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the system uh, in a moment. But um, we, we know, and this McKinsey report that you can see here, uh, talks about what the digital identity might create in terms of economic value. So you can see um, India having 6%. I, I think this is a little low from what I've already seen in India. I was um, at a conference, um, a global summit um, at the end of last year. And um, the figures that were quoted from the Indian government, one might expect, but were much higher uh, than this kind of figure. Um, but what, what we see is not only is it developing nations um, such as Brazil, which can have a significant value um, creation for, through digital identity, but even the UK and, and the US. Um, and what's important there is it's digital identity rather than a national digital identity, um, which is, is, is the main thing that, that I will talk about throughout this talk. This digital identity, so if, if one was to go to India, so I, as I said, I was in India, uh, if you use a tuk-tuk, if you're aware of uh, the tuk-tuk, uh, those uh, small vehicles by, by which are used are often for small, short distance uh, transportation, um, you pay using your phone and um, a um, contact list. It's, it, it's all done through the um, financial system that sits on top of the Adhar system. So any street vendors will have some way by which you can create uh, 
uh, transfer funds using your digital identity and the, the um, receiver's digital identity. And this really has made a, a, a big difference. And it meant during COVID um, in particular, that the government was able to give aid to many people that would have been difficult uh, otherwise. Um, I was in Manchester recently on, a, sorry, Crew recently on, a, on an event about um, digital identity. And one of the speakers was mentioning how in the UK, if you don't have um, an address, you can't get aid uh, from the government. That's the way that we guarantee that, um, or not guarantee, but try to assure that somebody is in fact the person they say they are. So we use an address. In India for Adha, they use a fingerprint um, and they have stored fingerprints and they rely on the fact that, that, that fingerprints are very distinctive, if not unique for every single person, depending on how it, it's taken. So if you want to really protect these vulnerable uh, parts of society, what's really important is that we should have trustworthy systems. And this is what we are looking at at the Turing Institute. Um, and the reason is that there are significant incentives to misuse, uh, breach, manipulate, commit fraud. Steve mentioned ab ab about the work that Surrey are doing in, in voting systems and there's some work also at Warwick in that area. Well, often uh, in, in countries, they will use the digital ID to support that. Well, what's important is that that needs to be trusted. It can't be manipulated and fraud can't happen. So we're looking at trustworthiness. Um, and one thing I'd like to say is that by trustworthiness, um, we are um, developing systems by which there can be claims made about a system. Uh, so we're not talking about whether somebody should or should not trust a system. Um, Trust is very much uh, temporal. It's very much context dependent. Um, by, by considering trustworthiness, we want to create uh, a system, new metrics or new mechanisms, which can enhance the trustworthiness of a system, which we would hope leads to more people trusting that system. But our goal is not to make people trust systems, it's to make systems more trustworthy. Um, and the, the, there are challenges. Um, Andrew was mentioning about uh, AI, I think, being his area. We all know about uh, deep fakes. Um, so the systems can be um, either erroneous or, or compromised in, in different ways. So from quite a few years ago, it's, it's over five years ago now, when HSBC rolled out its voice recognition system, that a BBC correspondent and his twin um, were able to access uh, the same uh, account. So there's some things that's a challenge um, that we have to live with. This, of course, is often used in addition to other controls. So it's not that HSBC have got a major vulnerability there at all, but they need to be aware of those kind of challenges. Um, and there was a, a case, and, and I'm afraid there's more than one case of this. I was in Canada last year. Um, speaking to a law firm who had been such a victim of a deep fake. Uh, so deep fakes are, are used for telephone calls. Um, if you look on the BBC uh, website right now, there is um, a, a series that Hannah Fry from UCL uh, is, is doing. And my MSc student, Trevor Wood from Amazon, talks about how they can generate very good uh, deep fakes uh, at Amazon with only 19 sentences. So it's much easier now to create these deep fakes. And these are being used to, in, in this case, the, the report from Forbes uh, a couple of years ago, um, results in a $243,000 loss. One thing that's important when we have these digital identity systems is to think about proportionality. So I won't go into details of the Ed Bridges case, which some of you will know. Um, but back in 2019, um, there was a landmark case, as, as it says, uh, about the South Wales police use of facial recognition systems. And basically, one of the things is there are errors in those systems. Uh, they had some very strong academics come over to explain where there are errors. 
errors uh, occur. And those errors, I, I should say, are disproportionately um, affecting people that are um, Asian uh, so and, and other uh, ethnic minorities. And for those reasons, um, there was a, at least a partial success um, for the com uh, complainant against South Wales police. Um, systems can be manipulated, um, um, not just the technology. Um, it was only um, within the last couple of years that a German art activist actually managed to get a real German passport. And that passport was uh, um, developed using uh, the application, used a photograph which was uh, used face morphing. So she took her own face and um, a face, that, uh, an image that she'd taken off the internet of a celebrity um, and combined the two. And the problem with that means that people can actually um, either, if you can morph two faces into one, either of the two people can use a single identity. There's also been uh, challenges about um, the data that we have. So there's been uh, attacks on um, Argentina's uh, biometric database. We know the stories about when the, the Taliban um, and the Afghan biometric uh, database. So actually the full database wasn't accessed, but there are some local images stored on some of these devices. So there are challenges around protection, protecting those. And we know AI has got some fallibility. So some great work by Cynthia Rudin uh, of, Duke winner, uh, of Duke University, uh, the uh, Squirrel Memorial Prize winner from, from, from last year. Um, who works on explainable AI and how she found that the compass score um, could be manipulated just by, could be erroneous just by um, a typographical error. Um, and I think many of you will have heard about uh, the Microsoft chatbot, which was very quickly manipulated to, into um, racist comments and, and swearing. So our framework, so what we want to do is, is, is look at addressing these challenges and trustworthiness can be defined in many, many different ways. So can trust, uh, but we define um, trustworthiness as security, ethics, privacy, robustness, reliability and resilience. Um, so around that robustness, reliability and resilience, the reliability, what we mean is that it is consistent in, in, in how it operates. The robustness means that if you give it a second set of circumstances that it wasn't expecting, it gives a robust uh, answer. So it's robust to different unexpected inputs. And resilience is really about where the manipulation is. So while security aims to protect a system, the resilience is there to, to detect when the system is under duress or under attack um, to recover from that uh, attack, so, it, so it's ability, ability to be resilient. So we're developing a framework um, and we're working under a number of different work streams. Um, and the, the first thing is in developing this framework that we're doing, what we're trying to do is look at what's happening in practice. So, so last year, um, a team of us from, from the Turing went to the Philippines we were discussing with the Philippines about some of the security threats to their system, talking about privacy impact assessments and how useful they are. And, and if you look around the UK's um, examples from, from various national and uh, local governments, they are of variable quality. Some are very bad uh, indeed, and some are very good. Um, so we're looking at um, threat modeling in practice. We've worked with ADHAR, on some of the challenges uh, they might face. Um, currently, the way the ADHAR systems is, is a foundational identity. So it is quite good at some of the privacy um, uh, respect that it has. However, sitting on top of that is functional identity. And that functional identity is, is where privacy leakages and, and linkage attacks could exist. So we're working with those. Um, we're developing the trust frameworks, trust, uh, trustworthiness framework, so that we can assess how trustworthy a system is. 
This isn't designed to rank different systems across the world, but rather to give a tool to those that are either purchasing or developing um, identity systems so that they can look to improve what they're doing. And we consider it across the design uh, of a system. So how is a system designed? So does it have good uh, policies and, and processes that are defined? Um, and how does it operate? So in operation, for example, for security, if you think availability is something that's important, availability can be taken from logs, some logs records, and that's about how it operates. Operation is also important because you might have a policy, but the policy actually doesn't work in practice, so the operation is quite uh, different. So we've created quite um, a large set of, of metrics that we are combining into those six pillars or facets of, of trustworthiness. We've, we've drawn on a number of sources, um, including 36 technical reports, a number of standards, some of them you'll have heard of, uh, some of the IC, ISO standards, um, so 27001, for example, the NIST 800 series, uh, et cetera, as well as peer-reviewed articles. We've been working on QR codes to, to make peer-to-peer um, -peer trust uh, a little bit easier. Uh, and that work, we are currently working with the modular open source identity platform uh, to see how we might embed that in, in a future release of their platform. Um, we're working on um, decentralized uh, public key infrastructure, and that infrastructure is important for verifying credentials and identity. So our trust chain project is, is looking at that. We're looking at specific issues around risk modeling of national digital identity systems. Actually, digital identity systems are quite interesting because not only is there um, not only is there a um, a government that is a stakeholder, but there are citizens and the organisation that is is um, responsible. So it could be very often what they have is systems integrators. So we're trying to look at this complex situation of risk to get specific understanding. We're also working on data and systems to support research and development and specifically around synthetic data. Um, so not only synthetic data, but synthetic environments that can be used as a test bed for future research uh, and development. We're working to improve fairness of systems. On the right-hand side there, there's some work from, from a paper, it was from a lab out of Maryland. And you can see that actually, um, if you look at the paper, that faces are, are quite poorly recognized. We know this from Timnit Gebru and others. But if you are a black female, basically you are much more likely to be misrecognized than if you were a white male. So we're looking to improve that fairness. So that's the current work we're doing at the moment. I'd be delighted to tell you more about them or deep dive into them at some other point, but I think my 20 minutes is up. So I, I will stop there. Thank, thank you very much, Andrew, and have a great time. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there because I especially think the networking is really important at these types of events, but unfortunately I couldn't be there today. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sure the audience has got plenty of questions. Um, saw them at the end, write them down, remember how to remember the questions you were going to ask. Um, next, we're going to ask our own uh, Professor Peter Schneider uh, to talk about uh, software networking. Steve. Thanks, Andrew. So thanks, uh, Carsten, for a great, uh, a great talk. It's really a tremendous amount of work that, uh, that's going on there. Um, I'm going to talk um, about a particular piece of work that we've been doing within, uh, within a project. Um, so this is work that I'm doing with, uh, with Ashley Fraser, who's uh, also in the audience and has uh, contributed to the, to the slides. Um, and I'll introduce um, the, the kind of self-sovereign identity approach. So this is a relatively recent approach to, um, to digital identity. Um, and we're applying it you know, in a particularly novel way um, for, for a particular use case, so I'll, I'll take you through that. So this is work that's going on within uh, the Decade project. So this is a project, um, it's a, 
within the centre center for the uh, decentralised economy. So it's particularly the emphasis is on decentralisation. Um, uh, so that's where uh, in, the, in the current the current world everybody can be both a, a producer and a consumer. So you know we have the the gig economy and, and these these kind of things where you know there's a lot of peer to peer interactions and the peer to peer aspect of the economy but what we what we see is that all of these kind of interactions um, are generally underpinned and mediated by a fairly small number of uh, big tech um, centralized digital platforms so what decade is about is about decentralizing those platforms as well and giving the um, the individuals more control um, and more ability to to manage their own um, what they do what they're doing online so that's the decade project as a whole we're um, interested particularly in the identity aspect so I'll talk through what um, uh, what 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 we've been doing with respect to um, uh, particular uh, particular challenges so I'll talk about, first of all what I intend to do is introduce the idea of self-sovereign identity um, explain what what that is, what's going on with that. Um, and then I'll talk about how we're applying it for a um, particular, particular problem. So just to come back to, um, to the idea of digital identity, um, you know, digital identity is really a, you know, about the information um, about an entity that, that's um, available online. So information, my digital identity, information that's available in a, in a digital form about, about me. Um, so traditionally, this has been managed through centralized systems, and we'll look at different different ways of that. And the idea of self-sovereign identity is to give the individual, to give me more control um, over the management of my own digital identity. So that's the information that is about me and the way that, that, that that's being used. So in terms of the ownership and the control and the management of, of that, that uh, information. So I, I said that traditionally, you know, identity management has, has been centralized in a way, or managed centrally. So as a user, as a member of the university, for example, um, I'll have uh, some identity lodged with the university. The university will manage my access to university systems and it will have a lot of information about me um, and my digital identity with the university. So there's an organization uh, that's got information about me. Um, when I need to um, interact with that organization, you know, it will issue, you know, I'll have a credential and I'm able to um, interact by means of demonstrating who, who I am. And then when I'm interacting with a different organization, let's say Amazon, Amazon, I also have an Amazon account and they have their own set of you know, information about me. It might overlap, there might be some bits which are, which are different, some bits that they don't need, um, and so on. And I'll have you know, identity lodged with a number of different organizations. And when I interact with that organization, they are using their information about me. So this is a kind of centralized identity management where the organization manages um, the, uh, the identity about the individuals that, that it's interacting with. So where we, when we have this kind of system, identities are not portable. So what I mean is I can't go to Amazon and say, can you transfer your information about me to this other organization that I would also like to have an account with? Um, and then there are privacy concerns. So these organizations you know, know, a lot, um, know a lot about me and I don't know quite, um, Quite, quite what they're, they're going to be doing with that information. So there's, there's issues around that. So then we move to federated identity management. So actually, sometimes it is useful um, for, to, um, to get away from this model where I have to remember however many passwords or uh, different credentials or use password managers, et, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, um, so having a federated identity management system will have, um, an organization that's, pro that's an identity provider that's, pro that's looking after my identity. Um, so for example, let's say Google or Facebook operate in this way. So they 
manage my identity. And when there's an organization that I want to interact with um, and demonstrate who I am to some extent, um, I will use that identity provider to do that authentication for me. So when you log into a site using your Facebook credential or your Google credential, this is what's going on here. So that organization doesn't have to look after all of my identity information because they are contracting that out, if you like, to the identity provider. So then I can operate, interact with different organizations and they, um, they can make use of the same identity provider. So then my interactions around my identity and about authenticating who I am are managed with that identity provider. So identities are portable within a federation in the sense that everybody who is happy to make use of Google for identity, I, you know, I only have to manage that identity once and then other organizations can also make use of that same facility. Um, but you know, we've still got different ID providers that, that, that don't overlap. And I may have privacy concerns around that. So if I'm using Google, then Google know about all of the different organizations that I'm interacting with because they're providing, um, they're, they're authenticating me. So there are concerns around that as well. And I'm still not able to, to manage exactly uh, what's, what's happening there. Something happened to the sound? Okay. Just here. So self, the idea of self-sovereign identity um, is that the user um, themselves is in control of the, the information that they're managing. Um, so as a, um, as a user, there are still going to be issuers that will issue credentials. And you can think of this as, for example, the passport office um, doing some checks on who I am. And then once they've done those, then they will issue me with a passport and, I have the, I, and then I have the passport. Um, so you will have issuers that will vouch for certain aspects of um, an individual and will issue credentials around that information, but that information is then held by um, the user themselves in the center. So there may be different issuers that issue different information. So the, the uh, DVLA will issue a driver's license um, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll hold on to various different elements of credential information. So issuers will issue credentials to, uh, to users um, and then those credentials can be used um, with, uh, with verifiers. Um, so the user can present those credentials to various verifiers that will, uh, that will, that will accept those. Um, so this is done using identity proofs. So the technology enables proofs that can be shown to verifiers to, to verify certain aspects about the user at, at the individual in the center. So different verifiers you know, will, uh, will be able to accept different aspects of, uh, of these credentials. So this is the self-sovereign aspect. The user has the credentials and is able to interact directly with the verifier using those credentials without the issuer knowing who they are, who they're interacting with. So the particular framework, the, uh, the standards uh, verifiable credentials framework ensures that the user can construct verifiable identity proofs that claim uh, that make certain claims about them. So the identity proof will contain facts that are supported by the credential about who somebody is, what nationality they are, you know, with their license to drive a car, etc. Um, and the identity proof will also say this: these credentials were issued by this issuer. So if the, the passport office is trusted, then the, um, the proof that's provided will be, uh, will be accepted by the verifier because they have trust in the issuer. And then there's a data registry. This is a, a public on the record data registry that supports the verification of the issuer's identity. So in, in terms of what's going on behind the scenes, uh, with the kind of cryptographic proofs, um, there will be information around the issuers, so around the, uh, the passport office's uh, public keys, for example, that will enable the verifiers to do uh, the verification that they need to do. And then there's also governance framework around, you know, who's able to put these, um, 
elements onto the verifiable data registry. So this is outside of the technology, um, and there's a whole ecosystem that um, is that is being developed. And I should say this is still very much work in, in progress. Uh, there, there's research here. This is not a mature ecosystem. It's still um, it's still in development and still being worked out. So self-sovereign identity decentralizes identity management because it's now uh, the user is at the heart of, of this. It's not, there aren't any of these big tech corporations that are actually controlling the, the credentials. Of course, they're, they're issuing the credentials, so they will, will have records of that, but they're not being used in the, um, uh, in the everyday um, interactions. Um, so identity is, is portable because the users are the ones that have the credentials. Um, but one of the key aspects as well is that it can provide um, privacy preserving identity solutions. So what do I mean by that? I mean that although the credentials may have a huge amount of information about me, I don't have to expose all of that information when I want to do some kind of verification. So for example, we can imagine a national identity card. Um, so, a, this, so an electronic national identity card with all of this information on it, tells you the name, tells you the date of birth, and all this kind of thing. If I want to um, do, a, do some kind of uh, verification, I may only want to expose my date of birth. So I don't have to. Uh, so there are ways of, of doing this with, with self-sovereign identity, which means none of this other information um, has to be exposed in the uh, verification proof. So we say, I have a national identity card issued by the provider that you trust, and they have issued it with this date of birth. So we can get proofs um, that, that, that can be checked that show that only that that, 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 that is a true uh, claim about the, uh, about the ID. And in fact, we don't even have to expose any of the information. We can just expose particular properties about that information. So if all, the only thing you need to do is show that you're over 18, in order to get into the nightclub or whatever, then you could do this and say, I've got a national ID card. Um, and one of the facts about the information on it is that I'm over 18, that my date of birth is more than 18 years ago from today. Um, so I don't even have to expose any of the information at all. So unlike a physical passport, which I might use to prove that I'm over 18, but whoever's looking at it can see all the other information as well. This allows me to do it in a privacy preserving way. I don't need to give away any more information than, um, than what I need in order to access the service that I'm after. And so there's an ecosystem that's, that's building up. So the past five years have seen a lot of developments and there's various uh, technologies that are, um, that are relatively recent and are still being being developed, but are being applied um, in particular in particular projects. Um, so these are generally speaking open source um, because they're looking to uh, bring it, bring in. You know, the more the more that are that are using it, the more uh, the ecosystem will uh, will develop. So in terms of the value of SSI, we get decentralization of identity management. So I'm now in control of when I use my credentials, what information I expose, and I don't, I don't, the, the issuers don't need to know who I'm talking to, who I'm using those credentials with. Um, so it removes the control of identity from large private, um, private companies. Um, and then, as I've said, there's privacy. There's privacy in two ways. One is I can use uh, these kind of verifications, which are called zero knowledge proofs, because they give away nothing beyond what you're trying to prove um, of just the necessary information for a particular service. So we get that kind of privacy. Um, and also the issuers, credential issuers, don't know where I'm using that. So the passport office doesn't know where I'm using my passport when I use it to, to access somewhere. So in the same way, um, I, I'm, I'm in control of that. That's just between me and the verifier. And there are other, other benefits that are claimed for self-sovereign identity as well. So the idea of decentralization, generally you can be more, more efficient if you're not having to go through some, some bottleneck that's controlling everything and so on, um, and can be used um, in terms of regulatory compliance. So I'll talk about our um, 
are the, the use case that we've used. Let's keep an eye, keep an eye on the time. Um, so privacy preserving image sharing is one particular aspect where we're making it, where we're applying self-sovereign identity. So let's say, look at the particular problem, the particular use case. So let's say we're a, a photographer or possibly a citizen activist or something um, that has got a, a, a photograph that we've taken. So there's a famous photograph where um, you may not want to give away who, uh, who you were when you took this photograph. But on the other hand, you may want to manage your rights over that photograph or assert authorship. Um, maintain that maintain the link that you've had that so you'd like to get this photograph out there this is a whistleblower um, exposing something um, so if I include identity information within the metadata of that photograph then that's got implications for um, the privacy of, of the photographer so I don't want to do that but if I omit it then the, then I can't later on make claims that actually that was me that took that photograph and I win my Pulitzer Prize or whatever so what we're looking for is using, uh, or the, the, the idea that we have is to use this self-sovereign identity um, approach to be able to protect and manage the authorship um, in a privacy preserving way. So we have, you know, the, the current options for doing this um, is that you have to deal with kind of trusted mediators. So you might deal with an established media organization who, who promise not to, turn, not to expose who you are, or you might um, expose, you know, include some kind of pseudonym or whatever, or completely remove any identifying information. But the current technology doesn't really give a way of, of maintaining that link that's completely under your control. So you know, there's either the need to trust, um, or um, you, there's, ver there's various other challenges about um, not wanting to relinquish your rights. And some organizations may want to see some credentials in order to trust the image. So they may want to know that you're an accredited photographer um, before they will trust this image. They wouldn't accept it from just anyone. So you want to be able to show them that you're an accredited photographer, but without telling them who, who you are specifically. So the kind of image sharing that we have, um, the photographer, if the photographer registers with a registration, um, authority with the photo with their identity, then that's exposing who they are. Um, and they can't prove the registration to third parties. It's only at the uh, registration authority. Um, and it's also giving away the identity. So it's not privacy preserving. So our solution is that the registration authority gives the photographer a credential on the, uh, on the photograph, um, which they're then able to use as a proof that they have, that they are the author of that photograph, that they, uh, they are the owner of a credential for that photograph, um, which they're able to use with the consumer without actually having, um, having to expose who they are. But they're able to show that they have a credential that shows they are the author of that, of that photograph. So then photographers can assert their rights to an image um, and it supports the, um, the anonymity of the photographer. So let's, um, so the, the solution, just looking at it another way, first of all, so with some examples, Ruth is the photographer, uh, Cavendish is the, um, the organization that accredits photographers. So she, that tells, uh, so she can get a credential from Cavendish that says she is a Cavendish um, accredited photographer. When she's got the photograph, um, she goes to another um, organization, which, uh, kind of certifies photographs. So Thode look, checks that she is a Cavendish creden um, credentialed photographer, but doesn't know who she is, just knows that she, she has this credential and is then able to issue a credential on the photograph to say this has been, uh, this credential has been issued by Thode, that this is a, an authentic photograph or this has been uh, provided by a, by a uh, certified photographer. And then Franklin News, who is the consumer, but wants to accept photographs that they feel that has got some provenance, um, will accept a zero knowledge proof that they are, that Franklin is dealing with somebody who has such a credential. And so for Fr Franklin will not know who Ruth is and Thode won't know who Ruth is. But Ruth ha has complete control um, in the sense that at some later point, she is able to 
um, reveal that actually, you know, she is the one that, that has these credentials. And uh, we use some of the ecosystem. So, um, to, in order, so we constructed a kind of demonstrator to, to um, get the proofs and, and show the interactions between these. So looking at the time, I think I'll probably finish with, I've got a two minute video that talks through this that we generated as part of a, the project. So I'll do that. And then that's probably all we have, have time for. Uh, so let's get this. Sharing photographs has never been simpler, making it easy for others to use pictures without the photographer's permission. To enable photographers to register their images while still preserving their privacy, researchers at the Surrey Centre for Cybersecurity and the Decade Centre, in partnership with Digital Catapult Field Labs, are using an identity management system known as Self-Sovereign Identity, or SSI, to develop their web app. SSI is a digital identity management model where issuers provide users with credentials, but unlike the more familiar identity systems, SSI allows users to control and manage their identity. The user collects credentials from various issuers. Credentials can be combined into proofs of identity, which can be presented to verifiers. The web app has been developed using the Hyperledger Ares SSI toolkit to help creatives keep control of their own images. Photojournalists may want to prove that an image is authentic, assert their rights relating to the image, and the photojournalist may want to remain anonymous while doing so. A photographer can set up their identity and obtain verifiable credentials for their photo. The photographer can then prove aspects of their credentials to others, such as a news agency wanting to use the images. Through a proof presentation, the photographer can prove authenticity of the image or assert their rights over the image. The news agency trusts the credential issuer and verifies the proof from the photographer so they can be assured of the photographer's rights. Using the Hyperledger Ares toolkit, the SSI system is privacy preserving so the photographer can protect and hide their real world identity. Okay, so, so that's the work that we've been doing, um, doing to date. Um, there are a number of open challenges and, and problems around this because it's still a very fast moving and, and developing field. So you know, developing the ecosystem and, and actually getting, the, getting this uh, kind of technology out there and usable is still, still very challenging, but this is, this is the direction that, that we're going in. So I'll uh, stop at that point and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you for keeping to time. That was brilliant. Um, our next talk, as I say, keep, keep the questions in mind, keep your notes, uh, your note taking to uh, save the questions for the end. Uh, our next speaker um, is uh, Rob. And uh, I won't try and recount uh, other than the sort of DSTL, and there's several companies that you now seem to be setting up and running. So uh, tell us about identity in that context. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, well, I'm Rob Solly. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of a new company called CoSymmetry, uh, but I've worked over the last 30 years in modeling simulation to help people make decisions. And I'm not an expert in identity, but I want to talk to you about how some of the work that I've been working on and related technologies associated with the metaverse will, I think, drive changes in the way that we need to use identity. So happy to pose a lot of questions. I may not be able to answer all of them today. So there are two areas of technology that I've seen that will lead to improvements and development of the, of the metaverse. The first is actually probably not so well known, but this is about the modeling and simulation of how organizations or systems perform and the models that have been used to build and measure the effectiveness of things over many decades, mainly have come out of the military environment. Those models have got ever grown, grown ever and ever closer together and become more and more connected. And now we have an ecosystem of models simulating the world around us. But at the same time, 
that whole technology area has been overtaken by the use of private citizens for social media, media and gaming. And that very similar set of technologies is coming together at the same time as this, this set of technologies that now are being used widely by businesses as well as governments to manage their effectiveness and performance. And I think collectively, these technologies are going to be the foundations of the metaverse. I'll talk a bit more about them in a minute. But of course, these organizations, governments, businesses and private citizens have very different ideas about what they need from an identity and why they need it. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities and threats that these technologies will pose for, for us. And I'll then finish by asking some questions about how this will mean we manage our future identities. So I'm not going to give you a definition of the metaverse. And one of the reasons for doing that is I think we're at a very early stage and very similar to the internet was in about 1995. And the picture on, on this slide is, you can probably tell it's a very young Bill Gates being interviewed by David Letterman on American TV, on the David Letterman show. And this is an interview from 1995 where Bill Gates completely failed to persuade David Letterman there was any value in computers and the internet. And, and David Letterman concluded by saying, well, I'm sorry that there's no money in computers and the internet. And of course, Bill Gates then proved him wrong. The thing was, Bill Gates could then talk about the technology that was underpinning the internet or that would, and the ability to share files and to make them publicly available. And that's what he was talking about on this TV interview. What he wasn't able to communicate was that these technologies would help people behave in a different way. They would change the way that they do things. They would change the way they do current things and they would help them do new things that they hadn't yet thought about. Now, I think we're at that stage of the metaverse now. You know, we've all sort of had a go, maybe played a few games or maybe been on a, I don't know, been on a social media um, event where you've met lots of other people, but it's not, we're not really understanding yet what this is going to mean, how it's going to change the way that we operate. So I want to talk about that today from two perspectives. One is how I think it will change businesses and governments and large organizations and how they, op they operate. And secondly, because that's, by the way, that's my main area of expertise, I'll touch on how I think it's going to affect us as private citizens as well. So let's just talk very, very simply about the, the tech stack that underpins the metaverse. Uh, I'm talking here as a, a current uh, employee of Improbable. Improbable is a company that builds computer games, uh, decision support systems for the military, but also basically is now focusing on the underpinning technologies of the metaverse. And these are the seven sort of core technologies that we see underpinning the metaverse. Most people tend to fo focus on the ones at the top, the user interfaces. They think about, oh, it's all about VR, and it's all about immersive technology. And if you listen to Meta, that's the story you'll get from, from them. Well, it's important to immerse yourself in a new virtual world, but I would argue that that's just, that's just the, the outside of it. What matters is what's inside it. And we also talk very much about VR goggles as if humans are the only people who are going to be acting in these virtual worlds. Well, the cyber physical interface, as we call it, is just as important. And this is about how machines, models, uh, and digital twins uh, or a, what we call a cyber physical infrastructure that's going to be effectively growing up around us will be connected together, not just humans. So all of those things will eventually be connected to the metaverse through a cyber physical interface. Now they, they come together in what we call the runtime infrastructure, which is a place where simulations of the virtual world take place. Those are run on compute, which is probably cloud compute but it doesn't need to be. And those simulations on the runtime infrastructure make great use of the content, which is basically models, things like you know, skins for, for, for people in a computer game or models of how different weapons work for a simulation for the military. All of those need to get stitched together in this runtime infrastructure. And all of that is supported by the two things on the right, networking, which is either you know, freely available on things like 5G or maybe very dedicated high bandwidth uh, networks for some specific users and some kind of distributed ledger technology which will enable um, identity but also um, 
sort of assurance about the, the quality of data and the, and the sources of data that get used and shared around the metaverse. So there are very there are already various versions of this kind of infrastructure, but most of these are for individual virtual worlds, and the metaverse is likely to be a whole load of virtual worlds coming together where people can then take their stuff from one to another. Um, and that is where we get some of these challenges posed. But I'm now going to talk just a little bit about what we in the in the uh, defense and security space have been using the models and simulations like the sort of vision at the top right there uh, for, and a little bit about my, my background. So my background is about supporting decisions, people making decisions. And I like to use these two dimensions to describe the spectrum of decisions that we get. So along the bottom here is the urgency of a decision. And people tend to think about the stuff over on the right hand side when they talk about decisions. They talk about the OODA loop. And I need to make this decision now. So what am I going to do? I'm going to observe and then I'm going to orient myself and, and decide and act. But actually, a lot of decisions take years or decades and they can't be made by one person because they are actually incredibly complex. And a lot of strategy stuff in the top left takes a lot of people a lot of time to think about. And one of the reasons it takes a lot of time is the interfaces between those people at the moment are sequential. So one person does a bit of work, they then pass it on to another, who then passes it back to them or passes it on to someone else. All of this work takes place in series. And if you could do this work in parallel with people actually engaging together and collaborating, you could speed up a lot of this process. That's what I've started to see with the work that we've been doing for the military is as, as people start to come together and collaborate, things get quicker and, and people get to make more confident decisions. But just kind of put this into three broad categories, the kind of stuff on the bottom right, simple problems, because sorry, I didn't describe the y-axis, which is how complex is a problem, simple problems that can be done very rapidly. Those are the sort of things that we give to machines to do at the moment. Um, the stuff in the top left, complex problems or even chaotic problems that take years or decades. These are the sort of things that we give to large organizations or large groups of people to do. Um, I mean, the research that we've just heard about is a great example of this. It's being done by a large combination of organizations working together over many years to design and develop something because it's incredibly complex to do. And then there's a, there's a sort of sweet spot in the middle where some simple analytical tools can be used very quickly to help people make quite clear and, and obvious decisions. So that's the kind of stuff that I've been lucky enough to spend my career doing. And, and one of the challenges of working in the defense world in particular is that a lot of this information that you need for these models is classified. And therefore we needed access control and identity checks to make sure that it wasn't leaked. So it's worth, I think, just taking a little look about how that's changed over my career. And I'm, I've, I've been around for about 30 years in this space. When I joined uh, in 1992, I just had a computer. It wasn't connected to anyone else's computers. Most of our information arrived via mail. I literally got two or three memos a week. That was all I received in terms of information. Um, if I wanted to find something out, I had to know who to ask. And we had a phone book. Uh, which wasn't particularly useful, but I didn't know what I didn't know, and I didn't know who to ask, so I had to go up my, my hierarchy. So there was no kind of menu of where you could find information or anything like that. And my identity was checked by having security clearance before I joined, and then giving me a pass, and then, and then I had a password on my computer, and everything else, once I got inside the building, once I got onto the computer, was available to me. But if I wanted to find out anything in particular, I had to go and walk down the, the corridor and people would recognize me over time. My identity was my physical appearance and people got to know me. Over time, we started to join our computers together and we started collaborating and sharing information, but only locally. Uh, and I still could only, I couldn't search for information. People would send me emails and I could go and ask for information, but I couldn't go and readily search for it. My identity was a little bit Broader, I could move around a little bit more in this in this world, but I the picture of me from you know 10, 10 years ago or so stood outside at the bloody great fence because in those days physical security both from you know everything was locked away in cabinets or fences like that. That's what how we stopped our secrets getting 
into the hands of the enemy. Move forward another 20 years and uh, I joined Improbable. Improbable was a gaming company initially and its philosophy was the complete opposite. Rather than keep everything locked down in this, in this locked safe, in this locked room, in a locked building, and a locked site, we will use the cloud and we'll make everything easily available and accessible to, to all of our supply chain. And this was a complete weight change in the way I was thinking uh, and, and caused me a, a huge amount of problems. But it also, I saw the opportunities it created. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then now moving on from Improbable to set up a company called Cosymmetry, I'm less worried about connecting to lots of computers. I'm now interested in how you can connect those computers to a lot of people. To come back to that top left point I was talking about earlier, where we need to solve strategic challenges that cannot just be solved by joining up computers. So it's joining up computers and people into human machine teams. So I'm just going to talk a little bit now about how I think the metaverse will change our interactions and what that means in, in two different uh, settings, in business decisions uh, and in private, and what that means for identity. And I'll pose some questions as we go. So firstly, I'm pretty sure that the metaverse and these, these technologies I've just talked about are going to massively increase the potential for collaboration between organizations and within organizations. And what do I mean by that? Well, uh, at the moment, so I, I'm, I spent most of my career building computer models of things. And every now and again, I would go and ask someone for some information. I'd bring it back and put it into my computer model. They would never see the model. They would never really get to engage with it. And then I'd ask someone else for some information. They would put it in. I would, they would give it to me and I'd put that in my model. Now, we're getting to the point now where that model is readily available and shareable with all of those people so they can all see the effect of the information they're providing. But not just that. They can start to play with the model. They can start to simulate it. They can start to ask questions of it. And as a result of that, they become users, not just providers. They get bound into that. But the more important thing is that they start to do that in parallel. I talked earlier about this problem of serialization. You know, if you think about uh, most ways we communicate historically, like sending letters or smoke signals or whatever, it's, it's, it's been a sort of problem of I send a message to you, you receive it, you think about it, you send the message back. And it's not synchronous, it's asynchronous communication. But the metaverse is going to allow us to do synchronous communication. And that means, in this case, synchronous thinking and synchronous development of ideas. And so I can now have a customer and a supplier both playing around with a simulation of the, of the system they're trying to design. Um, and they're both iterating it at the same time. And the customer is learning and changing their requirement. And the supplier is developing their design and changing its performance. All of that's happening at the same time. And that is quite an exciting proposition. Now, what about if it wasn't just the customer and supplier, but now it was five suppliers or 10 suppliers? What about if you made that system available to a thousand potential users and said, go and play with this thing and tell us what, what you like about it, what you don't? What about if you made it available to your competitors or your adversaries and asked them to try and pick holes in it? I mean, that's a bit of a, a move too far, perhaps, but, but actually, you know, if you really want to test something, you, you test it with people who are really going to try and break it. Now, all of that will become possible with the technologies that I talked about earlier. So that's really great because it means that we're going to accelerate and democratize decisions, whether those are decisions on the design of a system or design of a policy, a government policy could be developed this way. That's awesome. But think of what this means for the attack surface, because now suddenly we've got thousands of people potentially able to see the system that has previously in my career been locked down and only I dealt with. And I was the only person who understood it. It was a bit of a risk. If I went under a bus, no one else could understand it. But the safe thing about that was that there was no, other, no one else had access to it. Now, the, the, the risk here is that if you make hundreds or thousands of people available to see something, you need to be able to lock down very carefully what they can and can't take away from it. And of course, if you take away too much value from it, why would they engage with it? So in this situation, I think we need to check the identity carefully of all the people we're collaborating with. But I'll just pose a question. If I've got you know, a thousand people and I talked about the type of people I might want to give my model to to get them to test it, 
do I actually need to know any more than that they're an accredited person who's allowed to see that model? Do I actually need to know who they are? And I think sometimes it's going to be really beneficial to know who they are so you can build productive collaborations, you can trust each other. And there's a bit more to trust than knowing someone is trustworthy. I think you actually need to have a, a relationship with someone to really trust them. But I think there are probably two levels of trust here. That's just me making this up, but I'd be interested in your views later. So that's the first question. Does it matter who I am as long as I am who I say I am? Okay, so the second area is about uh, the metaverse is going to affect things, I think, in the, and this is largely in the business space. It's about connecting the real and the virtual worlds together. So um, what we're talking about here is, is firstly having a synthetic process to test and, and, and find design flaws in, in any of any plans, whether it's the design of an oil rig like this or you know, our, our path to, to net zero, um, but really trying to find what will stop those things working and giving as many people as possible the opportunity to find those flaws before we put it into practice. But also, because we can connect these models up as they get more and more complex, we can connect them to the real thing. We now have this idea of a digital twin of something and a, and a digital twin, depending on your definition, could well have a two way link. So it could receive real time data from a real system, but it could also then be used to pass real time control data back to that system. So it becomes part of the control system. Now, uh, that's that's awesome if you want to be able to control your heating in real time from your holiday home or you or so on. But it also, if you think about it, it gives us substantial risks because in the past, when I had a model of an aircraft carrier, if that got into the hands of the enemy, it was bad because they could understand the vulnerabilities of the aircraft carrier. If my model is actually connected to the aircraft carrier and they, it gets into the hands of the enemy, suddenly they can actually start doing things that will cause real damage without even having to you know, drop a bomb or, or fire a torpedo or something at the aircraft carrier. So this, is, this makes us a, a much more dangerous place to be. But the advantage is that we get real-time data feeding back, improving our models and giving us more confidence in the results. We get uh, also the ability to have AI playing with these things all the time, learning how to make them most effective and advising the users how to, how to get most effectiveness out of them. And then finally, we get this, um, it may not be a real advantage, but it certainly is an apparent advantage of immersive behavior. So as you put the user into this immersive environment, they start to believe uh, what the, uh, the system is doing rather better than if you just told them as an advisor. So all of that means that people are more likely to act on the results of these things. And I think we'll get greater confidence in their, in their decisions, but there are substantial risks of losing control of your system, not just losing information, but losing control. And also health and safety risks. If you build something like a, an oil rig and you've only ever tested it out in a virtual world and it then blows up then you haven't done any physical testing evaluation, whose fault is that? So the question I just ask here is, but how much are we willing to expose to each other, whether uh, that's another company, if you're the builder of one part of a system and do you want to expose all the workings and detail of your subsystem to the other companies working alongside you? Uh, or if it's as a private user and you're, uh, you're using the metaverse a lot, you're giving away a lot more information about yourself than you would ever normally want to do to another individual. So the final area, um, and this is where we now move much more into the sort of the commercial metaverse or the private citizens use of the metaverse. The final area I want to talk about is this idea of freedom of movement. Um, and this is where you can uh, go into a computer game and you spend a lot of money on an outfit that makes you look really cool. And then you come out of that computer game and you go into another computer game and you've got to spend a whole load more money on the same outfit. So can you not take your goods with you? And I know this sounds incredibly trite, but people spend a lot of money on this stuff. And actually they would like to be able to take their valuable possessions with them from one game to another. Um, but as we move forward in time, you know, maybe we'll have avatars that don't look like this, but maybe they'll look more like us. And maybe I will want to take my new m and uh, suit with me when I go into um, um, a different environment where I'm playing a game or I'm going to the bank online. 
you know, actually you want to be able to transfer stuff from one place to another. So the question is, as you move from one to another, whose rules are you going to be following in each of these places and who arbitrates? And I think we've already heard quite a bit about this, but you know, who's, who says that that's definitely you and you're allowed to have those, that suit or that, that, that identity. And um, I think another thing we've touched on already is do I have a one complete identity or multiple partial identities? To be honest, I don't want to have the same identity when I'm in my work metaverse from the one when I'm talking to my friends down in the pub metaverse. Um, so personally, I don't want to have just one complete meta identity. I'd rather have multiple ones, but also do I want to have multiple identities in the same place? So if I am, uh, if I'm coding, do I want to have one GitHub login or do I want to have multiple ones where I, I use different logins for different types of work or different to different customers? Um, and do I want them all to be linked together? And that just would lead me to the last point is, you know, do we actually have a right to be unidentifiable? Um, you know, we hear about these people who are like lurkers in, on social media who just like to watch and observe, but would rather not say anything. The, uh, you know, the, the people amongst us who are rather more introverted, do they have a right not to have to declare who they are? And so I just ask that as the last of my, of my questions today. So in summary, I think identity, the concept of identity is, has been changing in my lifetime and it will continue to, I think it's gonna be quite strongly affected by the technologies that will uh, bring us the metaverse. And I'm just saying they're in two different areas. One is this sort of idea of decision support for businesses and governments. And the other is the technology that's coming from gaming and social media. All of those I think will cause uh, great opportunities for us to collaborate and to work together in different ways. And that's great, but it'll open up all sorts of risks and vulnerabilities that we're going to have to assess to make sure that we're able to get the most out of operating in the metaverse. And hopefully I've asked some interesting questions. Uh, I can't give you the answer to any of them, but I'd be happy to discuss any of those. Thanks very much. Lots of questions, I'm sure, uh, sort up in people's minds. Uh, really interesting. Thanks for that, Rob. Uh, our final presentation um, from Paul. I'm not going to try and introduce you because of your long history and your previous work here, but Paul, over to you. Good afternoon. Um, the identity is broken. Um, I'm going to make an assertion here that every attempt at doing any large scale identity ecosystem has done one of two things. It's either failed miserably, costing in the case of the UK taxpayers a lot of money, or it has imploded generally into a subset of government services. Um, we can debate that one over drinks. Um, there are two reasons for that. One is actually people who are designing these systems don't understand what identity is. We'll get onto that in a second. Um, but uh, let's get in and what do we need to do differently? The, the other problem is actually, if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it, which is the oft used quote. The reality is that we have identity ecosystems that have failed and no one spends the time to work out why it doesn't work or why it doesn't, why it failed, or more importantly, why it doesn't scale. So this work originates out of Jericho, uh, the Open Group, uh, Cloud Security Alliance, and various others. Um, so let's just start. What actually is identity? So there's your definition. Don't expect you to read it and take it in. Um, I think the slides, or the, certainly the video is going to be available. Um, but it consists of three parts. It consists of a bunch of attributes about you. It consists of sameness. We'll talk about what sameness is in two seconds. And this is the key one, which is immutable linkage. Do you understand the level of linkage between the wetware, if you're a person, and the firmware? Because if you don't, you can't do risk and trust. So what is sameness? Sameness is what glues authentication to personas. And we'll talk about personas in a second. Humans do sameness. We use faces. Yeah. So. I'm the same person when you first meet me, will and today will be in the future. And humans are pretty good because it's hardwired evolution, you know, for, for millions of years of evolution. We do faces really, really well as a measure of sameness. And we get it right pretty well all the time, even if we haven't seen someone for 10 years. 
So what does this look like in a real life? So this is Tom. This is Fred, Tom's doctor. And guess what? In the days when you actually had a doctor you knew and you didn't see a different one every time you went to the doctors, yeah, you knew them and everything else. And guess what? You're doing sameness. You walk in and you say, hi, Fred, nice to see you. Haven't seen you for ages, Tom, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he has a bunch of attributes, professional attributes that go with him, a uniform, place of work, a history, his GMC, General Medical Council registration, deference of staff, used to be anyway when you were a doctor. Um, and that provides a context for his attributes, which form trust, confidence, risk, mental rules. If I'm going in to see the doctor because I've got a medical problem, I'm gonna trust what he tells me down to this set of attributes. Get the idea? This is Helen, this is Tom's girlfriend. Again, we do sameness using faces. And here we have a different set of attributes, our history together, the knowledge of the family, the shared experiences, et cetera, et cetera. There is the context. It forms some degree of trust that I have in Helen as a girlfriend. And what we're talking about here is two different personas. This is a professional persona. This is a girlfriend persona. And in real life, we have thousands of different disparate personas. And the disparate bit is really important. So personas ultimately are key to privacy and primacy. So this is my core identity, the I am me bit. And I'm always me. Yeah, I'm just not gonna change, ignoring split personalities and all of that stuff. But reality is I'm always me. Here I am standing here, that was Black Hat um, in Vegas, presenting as a security professional. And I have a whole bunch of other personas that you know nothing about. Here's another one of my personas. I'm a whitewater kayak instructor. And the attributes between both those are totally dissimilar. There is zero overlap between the two of them. And I could have other ones, sexual persuasion persona. And some might be sensitive. So if I have a um, subscription, let's say to Gay Times, if I'm, if I'm living and working in California, hey, no problem. If I'm living and working in, as a, um, a refugee agency in Afghanistan, actually that is hazardous to my health. So certain personas we want to expose more than others. I'm quite happy to expose my kayaking persona. I guess you already know my security professional persona. So an identity context is key. So what is identity? When people say identity, this is what it is. It starts with authentication. I said humans do faces as authentication. Authentication translates into sameness. You don't need any attributes whatsoever to do sameness. You're just the same person consistently across everything we interact with. And then we layer on top of that personas and attributes. And those persona buckets contain, should be, if we do it properly, disparate attributes. You should never have the same attribute in two different buckets, or you shouldn't need to if you do it properly. And as you build up the triangle, that gives us, allows us to do context. And on top of context, we can do rules and entitlement. And in the real world, we might want to do extra stuff. So if you're a bank, for example, and this is a banking example, you might want to say, you know, well, this is a banking normative transactional profile. I mean, does he normally transfer 6,000 pounds to a Russian bank on a Tuesday afternoon? Well, if he does it every Tuesday, probably we're fairly happy with that. If not, we're going to block that transaction. So we can do context, knowing on who, who you are in a banking persona. We can do context, and then we can layer on all these other bits and pieces to make business decisions, which enables us to take risks. So if that's what identity is, let's look at why identity initiatives fail. So here's the first one. I've got five of these, myopia or tunnel vision. The first one is blockchain. We have a bunch of people out there, all, all difference to Steve with, with the, uh, the self-sovereign identity. Self-sovereign identity has been hijacked. So the, the, the problem statement is spot on, and I totally agree with you. But self-sovereign identity has been hijacked by the blockchain crowd who go, solution is blockchain, now what's the problem? 
So we have an issue. Um, and uh, my system is going to be the one, whether it's Facebook or Google or Microsoft or whatever. Um, we can adapt my system to be just the one because we can make money out of it, which is the other problem. We have a fixation on just people. We'll talk about why people are flawed as far as identity goes in a minute. Um, we have no concept of thin file. That's the people who can't get enough information to create an identity. Really difficult. About 10 to 15 percent of people in the UK are what professionally people we call thin file. In other words, they don't have enough digital footprint to do digital identity. Real problem. Um, we have a fixation on technology. Yes, it's going to work with the phone, isn't it? Um, we have a first world assumption that it's always on. And of course, the spooks would like the government to be at the center. But of course, our spooks would like our government to be at the center. The other spooks would like their governments to be at the center. So we have a real problem. We design ever more complex solutions. Yeah, blockchain. NSTIC, the US National Strategy on Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. There's a T missing, sorry. Uh, Stork, which is the EU identity problem. This comes from a, an NSTIC paper that was done for the American government. This is how you do part of the services framework. Look how blooming complex it is. It isn't going to work. You know, the one thing I've learned doing 30 years of security, or 40 years of security is simple works, complex doesn't. Um, SAML, OAuth, anyone tried to know auth connection recently? If you try to code an auth connection, it's horrible. It's really, really, really difficult. And of course, we spend a lot of money on expensive consultants. And really, these are the two questions you should ask yourself. Is does my solution remove other methods or just add another? Because if it doesn't remove a whole sway, then why are you doing it? And why do we keep reverting back to passwords? We design sol solutions to solve one and only one problem. Yeah, UK identity card scheme, because we need to identify our citizens. Verify, which then failed again. NSTIC, the US government, 20 million C down the drain. The Kenyan Hyundai project, um, lots of projects out there. And most of these are driven by governments who say governments need to be at the core of a citizen's identity. They don't. Trust fails quickly. Who owns the root of an identity? Um, most business schools will teach you about uh, Sabre. If you don't know about it, look un under Sabre. Uh, the airline's booking system. Um, Facebook, Google, Apple would love to be at the center of your identity. Um, bank ID, often quoted as a success story. Yeah, collaboration of eight Swedish banks. Of course, if you bank with Barclays in Sweden, you're stuffed because they're not part of the club. Um, bank ID extends into Norway, Norway as well, because guess what? They're all Scandinavian, but guess what? They're two totally different systems. Um, TSEP for Milan Aerospace. Clubs fail as they expand because it's trust. If you've only got eight of you and they're all Swedish in a little club, we sort of trust each other. But expanded outside, I'm a Texas bank in, in you know, what, middle of nowhere in Texas, and I've got three branches, and I'd like to join your club. Uh-uh, isn't going to happen. So we can't expand it. And federation is the other one. Um, Steve talked about federation, why it fails. But the, the Problem statement is really simple. If A trust B and B trust C, does A trust C? And the answer is, I haven't got a clue. You can make, Federation works really nicely. So the only place I've ever, anyone has seen Federation work, generally with particularly Microsoft Active Directory, is when you buy another company who has Microsoft Active Directory and try to merge two Active Directories together is too blooming complex, so they federate it. But that's because you own both companies. Any other kind of federation is really, really difficult. And then you've got binary trust and the library. We'll get on to binary trust in a second. And here's number five. IT architects, I like you used locus control in your presentation. I, I, I really appreciate that because people don't get this problem of locus of control. Um, the only game in town, generally, for most IT folk is to say, we will manage it all for you and make it work. Because otherwise it's too complex. And it leads to this mindset. Um, 
The problem is, in today's environment, you're rarely authoritative for most attributes. So, if we're going to build a better mousetrap or a better identity ecosystem, let's ask some nasty questions. So, as the requesting entity, will the US accept a Chinese ID? The Chinese have got a really good ID system, by the way. Works really well if you're a Chinese citizen. But can you use it in the US? And will it work by, vice versa? Because in a global identity ecosystem, it needs to. And this is one of the problems with self-sovereign identity that's being built out there at the moment is, guess what? The people who own that blockchain is America and are American companies. Are the Chinese going to accept that? Not in a million years. So it fails at the first hurdle. The Indians probably won't either. They'll want their own because, look, we're 1.4, 1.6 million billion people. We're going to do our own one as well. Thank you very much. Initially, you get fragmentation. Can I walk into a refugee camp in identity? Because I walk into a refugee camp. My, my sister-in-law is a Rwandan refugee from the genocide. She had one parent who was Hutu and one parent who was Tutsi. Not a good place to be. But, she, you know, when you walk into a refugee camp as nothing on, you know, just the clothes on your back, I am me, can I get an identity? If you can't solve that problem, you're not going to build an identity ecosystem. Can I create personas that are good enough and got enough provenance behind them to do border entry? It's all about eliminating all those other ecosystems if you're going to build a proper one. Can my core identity be 100% anonymous? We'll talk about the one in a second. Um, can attributes I assert be signed and truly authoritative? Steve touched on that, so I'll leave that one. Can I assert complex context? And this one is really important. And again, this is, you need to understand the root of an identity. The root is me, I am me. I have multiple personas. In real life, what I need to do is assert attributes from disparate, signed by different people, personas. So if I want to buy a bottle of alcohol in the digital world, I need to be able to assert, I am over 18, the are you 18 proof that you demonstrated, really nice. I need to be able to assert Visa is going to pay you £20 for this bottle of whiskey. And I need to be able to assert to Amazon, this is where I'd like it delivered, please, Amazon locker or my home, in the knowledge that Amazon is not going to be fraudulent. So I need to, ass I need to assert three disparate assertions from different signing authorities. But Amazon, who is going to sell me that bottle of alcohol, needs to be able to test and know that all those three had a common root, me. And the only way that works if that common root is 100% anonymous, you cannot do it any other way. So are all my assertions privacy enhancing? Thank you very much. I'll, Steve's already done that one for me, so that's great. Are my biometrics and my identity attributes secure under my exclusive control? So we talked way up front about the problems that are coming with biometrics and spoofing and everything else. I do not want any of my biometrics to be managed by anybody else because then it can be spoofed. They need to be under my and my only exclusive control if this is to scale and work for the future. As a relying party, the people who are taking these attributes, can I have vis full visibility of the transaction chain? I not only need to know those three trusted attributes, but I'd also like to know where you're geolocated, what device you're using, is it rooted? You might care to throw it away and not use it as part of your risk transaction, but we should be giving it to you so you can make a really good risk-based decision. Will the system work offline, online, and direct entity to entity? So if I meet you in the middle of the Amazon jungle, and need to transfer your 10 pounds or 10 euros or 10 escudos so that, uh, you know, whatever you can do, I can do it, even though there's no network. How do you make that happen? Um, can I use it for secure communications? Because that would be really nice. Can I use this relationship to prove who I am? Can I do the photos example? Brilliant. Like that one. Um, more importantly, can I understand organizational entities as well as people? Can I leverage trusted attributes for KY, uh, know your customer? So let's turn the problem quickly on its head. 
So we can discuss this one over um, drinks afterwards, but only 100% anonymity solves the problem that we are talking about, whether you like it or not. And actually, this is what people want. We went out on an anonymous survey and actually surveyed people and said, who should be in control of your personally identifiable information? Guess what? Me. The US and UK governments, would you like you to choose a commercial body that I choose? That's the, that's the government's answer to that question on your behalf. It was called UK Verify. It's not what the people want. Who should control how my personally identifiable information is used? Again, guess what? Me. I think we had a few Europeans in there who sort of believed in GDPR. Um, so ultimately, and again, this goes nicely to uh, some of the self-sovereign work, personas are key to authoritative attributes. So the rule with attributes is you should only sign attributes for an entity for which you are truly authoritative. So here's organization government, here's me, here's my citizen persona, and guess what? It has five attributes, and only five attributes for which, I, for which UK government is authoritative, because they signed my birth certificate. They shouldn't be doing anything else, and everybody else should be using those and not storing them afterwards. You have to, if you are going to do context, you have to understand entities, not just people, because you need to understand the interaction. So an entity, a unique thing with distinct and independent existence. So we all know about humans and most people design ecosystems for humans, people. Yeah, we get, you know, the computer geeks go, yeah, user ID, user identity. You sort of slap them around the face and say, uh-uh, no. Don't do that. It is not an identity. It is authorization. And yes, it is people authorization, but you need to do entity, organizer, entity authorization. So we need to consider devices, organization, code, and agents, and a whole bunch of other entity types. You can start to understand when you're making risk-based decisions that the join between me and organization UK government is my citizen persona. The join between me and the corporation is my job. The join between me and my laptop is Paul's laptop, or Paul using a corporate laptop, because all of those affect how you do access control and make access decisions, particularly on the fly. So ultimately to finish up with, what do you want out of here? Do you want trusted identities? based on trusting the entity that provides a binary, trust me, I validated this for you, which is what you get if you go to Google, Facebook, or any other federated system. Basically, you authenticate with Facebook, and Facebook says, this is Paul Simmons. Or in the case of when I worked for AstraZeneca, logged into the AD system, and Active Directory said to 138,000 other devices inside AstraZeneca, this most definitively is binary one, Paul Simmons. It's not a way to make a risk-based decision. Or do you want identity and trusted attributes that you as the person taking, or the entity taking the risk can validate according to your criteria, your context, and based on your risk appetite? Because that's the only way you make a global identity ecosystem work. So do you fix the liability problem? Yes, you fix the liability problem by only signing or attesting attributes for which you're truly authoritative. Do you fix the risk conundrum? Yes, because you give all the information to the entity taking the risk and let them make the judgment. And we need to stop doing things for which we're not truly authoritative. I think I'm out of time, so I will... Uh, Ignore the conclusion. There we are. You can see these at your leisure. And that's it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul.
<clears throat> and if you haven't got questions, I think uh, both Rob and Paul had uh, compelling lists of questions there that I almost want to run through. We could spend a whole day discussing those. Can I invite our speakers back? And uh, Katie, can we get our online panelist or is he joining us? So um, please take a chair. All those pent up questions that you've been thinking about, um, we will stop at six, I promise. People do need to catch trains and so on, but there will be drinks um, and uh, nibbles. Uh, so if you don't get to ask an answer to your question now, uh, then by all means, button hold them, uh, the panel afterwards. Um, who's going to be brave and go first? Um, if you could just uh, remind people who you are and wait until I bring the microphone to you so people can hear. Hi, my name's John Bullard. Um, about 25 years ago, several of us in this room were in the operational risk area of a large financial institution. And we worked with a bunch of banks globally in building a trust framework, a little bit analogous to Visa, MasterCard, which of course we use every day wherever we are for payments. Now, that, that seemed to me 25 years ago to be the way forward. You were using regulated entities. To Paul's word, you weren't using governments. You were using regulated entities as purveyors of digital identity, if you will. That was a simple world 25 years ago. It is much, much more complicated with dis distributed ledger technologies, et cetera, as you excellent speakers have, have talked about. So my question is kind of almost open. What are we gonna do? Because here we are 25 years later, still talking about the same issues. I'll, I'll kick off and say you can't make it work. So you just have to give up. It, it's, a, it's a flawed methodology to say we're going to have a club of people. So if you look at it at the moment, forget you know the example for a second. I mean, I, I have a personal bank account with Nationwide. I have a, I have a business and um, a canoeing account with um, Barclays. And I needed to, I was in HSBC yesterday and they want to start KYC checks on me from ground zero because guess what? Even though we're all regulated under British banking regulations, HSBC won't accept the fact that I've done KYC checks till I'm blue in the face with Nationwide and Barclays, and I have to start from scratch. And trust me, I've been taking two weeks to try and verify bits and pieces with them, and it's a nightmare. So yeah, it, it doesn't work. We should accept it doesn't work, and we should look at doing differently. Rob, Steve, any thoughts on that? Carsten as well. Um, I'll, I'll come to you in a minute. Just uh, we'll have to dine in a minute. So, so, no, I, I would just say I um, agree with that. I think the the issue around the kind of scalability um, is is a real is a real challenge, and I I, th I think the the idea of trying trying to have that that uh, kind of overall approach what just doesn't doesn't scale up. Doesn't. The the only thing I would add is is um, that there are other areas where i mean this is what you described as a classic problem for so many different areas you know why don't we all just have the same mobile phone provider or the same internet uh, we, you know there, there is there are, and there are examples there must be examples of some sectors where it has made sense for one way of doing things to rule them all but i think economics tells us it isn't usually most efficient to have just the one and then everyone's happy with that so maybe having a few competing providers or ways of doing this is ultimately in our interests. Carsten, I don't know. I'm hoping you can hear all of this. Um, do you have any comments on this? Unmute yourself and say something. If not, <laughs> if not, I shall move on to the next question. Um, who, who would like to follow that up with another question? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Paul Dory, someone who was 25 years ago of a group of banks trying to make a system like that work. Um, it strikes me we still seem to be in a world where, where acceptance of an attribute is good enough without an identity attached to it. 
um, which is giving us a sort of 80% okay situation. Um, do, and, and, and basically, it's the, the courts seem to be the place where you finally sort it out um, if it all goes pear shaped. When you say that wasn't my credit card that was used, it was it was somebody else's. But frankly, all the merchants at the time cared about was it was a valid credit card, not a valid person. Um, so I, I'm, my, my my challenge is: do you, do we think that that eighty percent good enough is just going to drag on um, and be a big inhibitor to making any progress in the space? <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to kick off again. Um, so the one thing I didn't touch on was this concept called immutable linkage. So as part of communicating that set of attributes or whatever you're required to do the transaction, the one thing that should go with it is how well, and I alluded to earlier, is the wetware, me, connected to the firmware, the device that I'm using to do it. And that has to be communicated to the person taking the risk as part of that attribute set. So not only is this is my, I'm going to pay you $15.99 signed by Visa, but I was using this phone. It isn't rooted. It's using this version of the Android operating system. And I was connected to it via a fingerprint authentication and on this model so that actually if you really want to get into a high risk scenario you can say yeah we know where the threshold is set for for fingerprints on this samsung device and we know that there are no known exploits against this fingerprint reader on this samsung device therefore i can make a more high a, a more comfort um a decision a risk decision with more confidence than i could otherwise of course, you might then choose to say, well, I'm happy with that as a risk decision for $15.99, but actually for a lot more than that, so you know, it's three, four hundred pounds or even a thousand pounds, then I'm going to my risk price would say, I need some step-up authentication. So I'm going to send you a text or an SMS. But the key in today's world is frictionless. So can we make it as frictionless as possible by providing as much information in the background? that you can make a good risk-based decision on. And the key to that is immutable linkage, which is with what level of confidence uh, is the firm is the wetware linked to the firmware? I, th I think that's always been the case. I don't think it's ever, um, you know, even with with credit cards back, at, back in the day, you still had to sign and that was... Mm -hmm a way of linking an individual, you know, and the fact that you can do the signature with with the card. So it wasn't so I think there has always been a, a an, at, an attempt or built into the system a way of authenticating the individual as well as um against the information that's that's being being presented, the credential if you like, that, that's or a, attribute you're saying that's um that's being presented. And and does that position hold true in the developing work of fake, world of fakery, uh, where fakes become indistinguishable in pretty much any aspect of the wetware you care to mention, does that still hold? Do, does that model still hold true? You, what you've been talking about? I, I, I think it holds true if you, as the entity to which these attributes are saying, actually own your own biometrics. The problem comes is when someone else is storing those biometrics or they're going to an external system to be validated because then it's open to faking. If you actually own those biometrics, in other words, it's linked to you personally, whatever aspect it is, and you own the verification, then all your device is doing is saying, I have passed, I have passed, what you are passing to the vendor is, is I have passed validation using these criteria rather than saying, here's a biometric, can you validate it? And that's where the problem lies. I think you all touched on roots of trust and what that looks like going forward. Um, th there's a huge number of assumptions we make about trust and roots of trust <laughs> now. What will they look like in 10 years' time? What, what, how do we trust something? Is it only valid to, uh, when you're saying owning your own credential, I think it came in the self-sovereign, uh, discussion too. What, what do the future of uh, Roots of Trust look like? Steve, do you, do you have a view? The future of Roots of, of Trust? trust. 
what can I, what can anyone trust? Um, what's the immutable uh, element of trust? What do you put your trust in? How do I know I own my own biometrics when somebody else can fake them? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, a really difficult question. I think ultimately there, there, um, that I suppose there's two two thoughts. One is ultimately you're always dependent on trusting something, mm. um, and that that is trust that could be subverted. So you may not be just justified in that. Um, so the kind of ultimate root of trust, if you like, can never be never be there, and and to some extent, um, you you know you're making a risk judgment on whether the trust is good enough mm. uh, there are but there's also a concept of zero trust systems yeah. where actually you don't have to trust <laughs> anything uh, which is the kind of opposite of what, of what i just said that's a, a kind of concept of what um uh an ideal that we'd be aim aiming to get to it's not clear to me that you would actually ever be able to get there but the the less that you have to trust the more confidence you the more confidence you can have in the judgments that you're making. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. I mean, there, there are big overlaps here with zero trust, the work that's going on in zero trust at the moment. Um, but ultimately, the work that we did originally, the, so the, the, the sort of pure original research said, the only way you make this work is with 100% anonymity at my root of trust or an entity's root of trust to be, to be accurate. Therefore, Actually, your starting point is you can't trust me because I'm 100% anonymous. There's the starting point. Now figure it out. And actually, it sounds it sounds horribly counterintuitive. Having been a security professional for, for 35, 40 years, the first time we discussed this, I could not get my head around it because it was 100% counterintuitive. But the more you delve into it and realize, actually, it solves most of the problems out there. And, and Rob, does that does that work in the metaverse? Well, I was just thinking that there is, you know, if you go back 150 years, you would probably mostly have traded with people that you knew day to day. You know, you you had a chance to build up trust either through getting to know them or through gossip in the village. You would know who you could trust and who you couldn't. And I guess in those days, with that very closed ecosystem, you know, where transactions are taking place, you could rely on your your common knowledge of the people around you and those are the people you'd be working with. Maybe we're in a unique position at the moment where we're able to deal with anyone around the world via the internet. I mean, literally billions of people who we're never going to meet. And we've got an amazing way of checking their identity at the moment, which just works. Maybe in the next 10 years, I mean, you can go two ways, can't it? Uh, our ability to, to check on people's identities keeps pace with all of the things are going to make it harder and we we continue to live in this luxurious position but i think it's probably worth recognizing we're in a really luxurious position at the moment compared to 150 years ago we can trade with anyone and trust almost anyone my worry is that if you put the onus of checking back on the individual i mean how many people in this room click i agree whenever they get a, a message about cookies and how many go through the effort to actually minimize the cookies and so on most people just cannot be bothered to do the due diligence on things. They just want a quick answer and then they get scammed. And that's my concern is that we need to make it really easy for people to check identities if, it, if the emphasis is going to go back on them. I don't think most people are up for that at the moment. But let me turn that around. How many people here use eBay? Come on, be honest. How many people here, right. How many people know the people at the end of the transaction? What do you do? You check that little thing that says 98% or whatever versus 60% and you don't trade with the person who's 60% and you do trade with the person who's 98.8 for two identical bits of goods. You know nothing about the identity there. It's an anonymous transaction. Chances are because it's coming from China. Um, but it's an anonymous transaction with 100% anonymity or hiding behind eBay anyway, um, even if they know who it is. But what you're trading on is their reputation. So get away from not actually having to understand the identity of the person or the entity, because in that case, you're trading on reputation and that's all you care about. And that's actually exactly the same situation as the, the one I was talking about 150 yeah, years ago. Yeah, it is. You're just building on gossip from millions of people instead of... Yeah, uh, or repu it's reputational trust. Yes. 
you know, have I ordered off them before? Did they deliver on time in full? Yes, they did. Well, I'm going to order from them again, even if it's 5% more expensive than someone I've never met before. It's reputational trust. Don't get hang up on identity because quite often, in most places, all you're interested in is sameness, not identity. Fascinating. <clears throat> We've got time for one more question. I apologize. We are running a bit late. Alex Greenland. Uh, I work in trust and just wondering whether we ignore the real world too much, whether identity matters sometimes. We've all entered here, checked in, and given our name, and that's fine. It's just work, but it doesn't really matter because we didn't need to verify anything, they didn't need to verify anything, because all we're doing is coming to an event. So I'm just wondering whether sometimes the digital world does too much and it tries to encroach too much and whether we just need to use real world identity and real world things a bit more. <laughs> too much digital real world. I mean I I I think the example you gave of coming here is a relatively low risk one. Therefore, it's fine that we just gave our names as we came in. Um, obviously, if you were spending thousands of pounds on something or putting your life at risk, then you'd want more assurance, I think. Um, but I'm, I'm, I don't quite know what you mean by use more of the real world. Do you mean actually meet in person or talk to someone on the phone? Or... Yeah, so like, we, we all are making tough decisions. We're all using so we should take advantage of the human more yes. in all of our stuff, which you can't necessarily get digitally. So yeah. Yeah. We, we sort of trust the people when you checked in and, and that is enough. And then you, you, you do more you need to. I just don't think we're, we're doing enough as a human. So I think as, there's a really interesting point there about, you know, how we are, you know, a, what, was, was it, who was it who mentioned it earlier? Maybe Carsten mentioned, mentioned it about, you know, we've evolved uh, these abilities to, to recognize faces and now we've got this ability to build a quick maybe incorrect but assumption about someone's background and whether they're trustworthy or not very rapidly um i am very interested in whether some of that could be tra could transition into the metaverse if everyone's walking around in weird looking uh you know avatars and you've got no way of actually understanding what they're really like that's it's <laughs> unlikely but i do think that people are going to I mean, my son has met, made friends online when he's playing games. He has learned to trust them through playing a computer game that doesn't really, they haven't met in person. So I think there are ways in which the metaverse can help us mm. use those innate senses. And if it's carefully managed, then it, it can be done in such a way that it'll be effective. But I don't know if I really answered your question, but I, th I think the answer is yes, there must be some way in which we can, we can use those senses. <laughs> I'm going to turn it on its head and probably say when it comes to risk-based decisions, the answer is no. Um, I'll give you a very quick example. Um, as I said up there, I shared I'm a, I'm a canoe instructor. Um, in the good old days when I started, it would be, well, Paul's a really good chap. He knows what he's doing. And, you know, I, I feel safe that my kids are okay with him. Um, then we had the Lime Bay canoe tragedy where an adventure centre on the south coast managed to kill six children. Um, we are now a regulated high risk because it is acknowledged as being an at risk sport. So if I want to take your kids kayaking, then it's really simple. You take a photo ID that says Paul Simmons. That gives sameness, which is the name. The name attribute is actually relevant because what the name attribute is links it to that. Yeah, which is my British canoeing identity that says Paul Simmons on it. And that says I'm a level three kayak instructor, so I'm qualified to teach them on the Olympic white water course. That's what you should be interested in from a risk point of view. The name and whether I'm a nice guy actually is fairly irrelevant. And Steve, any final thoughts? <clears throat> no, I mean, I think that's a good, a good point to end on. But, uh, but I would also say the kind of the cure um, you can be subverted as a, as a human as well. It's kind of scams and people are taken in by plausible, plausible sounding con artists um, all the time. So, you know, again, it's about it's about what what the risk what the risk is. But I think the kind of human judgment that isn't um, isn't isn't um, always there either. 
I think we're just scratching the surface and we could, uh, <laughs> we're just getting interesting. So uh, I'd invite you to, uh, uh, in a moment, thank uh, our panelists. I'd also invite you to uh, hang on and uh, observe the SASIG's uh, number two rule, I think it is, make five new friends by joining us uh, for Drinks and Nibbles. Um, I'd like to thank Katie and the other organizers for uh, yeah. organizing this, making it seamless, organizing Zoom and so on. Uh, and I'd encourage you to uh, keep an eye out for our next one, which uh, is going to be on uh, cyber physical systems and uh, what does the future of resilience mean? Uh, given the last three years, we think it's a uh, topical subject. So welcome your participation in that. Uh, thank you very much and join us outside. <laughs>